pleasure to uh, really a pleasure to be here and uh, and to be with everyone. And I don't know if everyone uh, is looking at the uh, the title slide. I was having a little trouble seeing it, uh, but I wanted to to share with everyone the reason that we're focusing on audit planning today is because it is, in my view, uh, one of the most, if not the most, important steps in completing an audit. You know, it sets the tone for the audit. It sets the shape for the audit. And when audit planning is well done, it really does a it does a great. It's great. It's fabulous. When the planning effort is not so wonderful, wow, the uh, audit experience can be a little bit, uh, maybe even a little bit painful. Uh, but certainly, the audit's a little bit more difficult. What we'll focus on today uh, are a couple of techniques. Uh, the way I, I've organized the, this session is we're going to focus on four uh, key questions, and we're really going to zoom in on how do we get the most and best uh, business knowledge and business information. More on that in a minute. But as a result of, of participating today, I think you should take away a couple of techniques for analyzing processes more rapidly. And when I use the term process, I, I mean any co collection of functions. Uh, it might be an entity, what, what, what it's doing, but getting up to speed on that. And I'll share a couple of techniques for thinking about the information that you, that you collect, because it's not enough to collect complete information and accurate information. You know, it's what are we doing with that information and how should we think about it. I will uh, talk a little bit about using a planning checklist. Some of you might already uh, have a planning checklist as part of your audit tools when you're conducting your reviews. And then we'll talk about what types of information should be uh, memorialized or recorded uh, concerning the the audit scope and uh, and objectives. So that if somebody else needed to look at what you did, they would be able to understand why you set the scope uh, the, the, the way you did. I, I think one of the most critical things in this whole phase is business business knowledge and uh, and having some uh, business acumen. And I don't know if you've ever heard the expression. Some people have said, hey, if you can audit, you can audit anything. And, you know, I, I think that this statement is partially true. But I think if you don't understand the business objective, if you don't understand what they're doing, I think that your audit risk increases. So the first uh, thing that I wanted to cover is uh, I, I think it's very important that when we're planning our audits that we follow the critical linkage. And this is something that, uh, that I've written about in, in my uh, book, Mastering the Five Tiers of Audit Competency. It's a simple looking model. I think it's, its beauty is its simplicity, yet it's, it's really high impact. What we are going to focus on today of the four steps, we're going to focus exclusively on the first one. But the idea here is if you are doing risk-based reviews, the critical mentally, the critical linkage that you need to have in mind is starting with what are the folks we're auditing, what, what's their objective, what are they trying to do, what are the major steps that comprise the process that, they, that they're following. And then from that, we can think about the inherent risk, and from there, we can think about the controls, and we can evaluate the controls for design and operating effectiveness and determine whether any corrective action is needed. But it's really, uh, we're going to be focusing on, uh, on step one. And there's a lot to do in, in step one. There's a lot of information that needs to be collected, a lot of data points. And what we're advocating, not surprisingly, not surprisingly, is let's use a structured approach to analyze the processes that we're auditing and then based on this analysis, based on the information that we have collected and we've looked at, let's set a useful audit scope. And I think about folks who are planning audits for the first time, you know, the people who are new auditors in charge, and even people who are experienced uh, lead auditors. When you're auditing an area that you're not familiar with, it's brand new, you know, how do we, how do we ramp up? 
and collect the information in a way that makes, makes some sense. The process that we want to use is, it needs to be controlled, repeatable, and documented so that anyone can, can follow uh, the same process to plan, you know, to plan an audit. One of the things that we'll do in this webinar is focus on these uh, four questions. What information should we collect? I think it's a really basic question, but I think it's an important question. Uh, if we don't understand what information we need to collect, we could forget about it, not include it, and then our audit risk would go up. So the second question really zooms in on, well, how do we make sure then that we've got complete information? I might touch on the topic, but I don't touch on it, you know, in, uh, thoroughly. Third question we're going to focus on, and I think on a personal level, this is always the challenge for, you know, for us when we're on our reviews. How can we gain a faster understanding of the process under review? Of course, without sacrificing accuracy. Because let's face it, what we fail to understand, and fail is a very strong word, but what we don't understand in planning will come back to bite us when we are doing our detailed assessment and when we are testing the controls for uh, design and operating effectiveness. And we certainly don't want to waste time on the back end of the audit. We want to be able to move through the audit in an organized and an and, and efficient way. The last question we'll focus on in this webinar is how should we organize and analyze the data so that we can, re we can really come to a useful conclusion concerning the audit's objectives and scope. You know, once again, we don't want to be in a situation where we're near the end of the review and someone is saying to us, like our boss, did you look at ABC? And we have to say, oh, no, you know, we didn't. We didn't look at that. So the way I've organized the webinar is we'll take each uh, question and then we'll look at some possible solutions uh, to, the, to the question. So we'll start with the, the, the basic question about, well, what information should we collect? And I would say to you, I think the starting point for collecting this information is let's begin with the business objective. Now, again, this sounds very obvious. And if you read any management textbook, they all start with have a goal, have an objective. I'm sure all of us have heard about SMART, the SMART acronym, you know, specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound. But I think in practice, most organizations don't have easily accessible uh, objectives. Uh, you know, when you're planning an audit, even think about the most basic. And we're going to do a payroll audit. It's probably like one of my favorite uh, favorite processes. We're going to do a payroll audit. How obvious? How easy is it to get the objective for for payroll? It's kind of implied. It's really not so much uh, that it's it's stated. You know, it's really stated out there. I also think then a challenge in getting the objectives is speaking to the right people. Now, if you are in a smaller organization, it's probably easier. But if you are in a large, global, matrixed organization, figuring out who you need to talk to can be a bit of an ordeal. And let's face it, if we don't include the right people, if we overlook someone, Obviously, we would do that accidentally, not on purpose. But if we overlook somebody, we might be missing a whole piece in the puzzle. We might be missing an entire perspective. So I, I think that interviewing people, not only interviewing several, but making sure that we have the right people is very important. So we have five polling questions in this uh, webinar, and we're coming up on the uh, on the first one, and I wanted to show you that polling question. Here it is. Based on your work experience, business objectives are usually explicitly documented by management or usually implied and not documented by management. What do you think? 
And Anne, while people are answering that question, we do have one question for you to answer if you'd like to do that right now. Sure. Um, one of the, the questions is, what is typically the hardest part of getting the plan, planning process right? What do you, you it's it's a I, funny question. It's, I don't think it's a funny ha ha question. It's a challenging question because getting the planning process right right has so many dimensions. Uh, I'm thinking about it through the lens of getting it right so that my boss approves it because I think that that's huge. I think that we shouldn't go forward unless uh, the you know the head auditor is on board uh, with the scope and the objective. So that means documenting it in a way. That makes sense and stands alone. But before you can document it, I think a huge challenge is just the communication, interviewing people, getting the right people, getting enough time with the right people. And after you get the time with them, people process information, including auditors, process information at different rates. So I might interview three people and I might need a couple of days to think about what they said to understand what they meant. So I think there's th there's three different challenges, the mental processing of the information, the data collection to get the information, and then documenting it so that other people can buy into it. Do, do we have our survey results? We do. So the people answered it, and I went ahead and put them up on the screen. Yeah, and it looks like we've got a bright group as usual today because I would agree that at least in my life experience, usually the business objectives are implied and they're not documented by management. In fact, sometimes the value that we add to organizations is documenting them and bringing them back to management and saying, do you agree? The other way, I think we add value if we are doing process audits and not departmental audits is that we're showing a high level picture to management of the span of the activities that achieve the business objective. So the business objective, I think, is the start. Uh, I th and, and, you know, you could be digging around to get that. I think there's some other information that we need to, we need to focus on, uh, process-related information, meaning what exactly are they doing, you know, who is involved in it, uh, when are they doing it, the systems and technology-related information, what applications are they using, what systems are they using, what platforms are they using, regulatory, are there any regulations in particular that affect their business? And I just want to pause at this point because you can read the screen faster than I can. It's not the topic. It's who you need to talk to to get that information. You know, it's, it's really a rare auditor that is going to be completely up to speed on all of these topics. I think it's impossible, and that's a big word, and I don't mean to sound negative, but staying abreast of the changing regulatory environment, I mean, good luck. The cyber risk and technology, the change in technology, staying abreast of that, <coughs> I think that's really tough. By the way, where you see governance on the slide, I'm referring to, <coughs> excuse me, uh, how people set their own policies, how they rule themselves. You know, what committees do they take their, their marching orders from? Who promulgates the standards that they need to follow? Uh, what's the reporting structure? Uh, with, you know, with oversight, is, who's checking on who? Is there a function that's checking on who? Basically, how does management senior management inspect what they what they expect. Uh, I, I cited financial information. I'm almost sorry that I ran out of room on the slide and didn't say key metrics just in general because I think, you know, from an internal auditing perspective, the non-financial metrics are as if not more important than the financial uh, information. But the list of topics I think is prodigious. I mean, I think there's really – just so much to think about here that I think it's hard to stay uh, to stay organized. So let's look at a little case study. I want your thoughts on this. The case study is we've got the mission of 
the Invincible Insurance Company is to be the best managed regional provider of personal insurance as measured by customer satisfaction scores of at least 98%. The Invincible strategic goal is to secure and maintain a 30% market share. So that's the backstory. That's that's the deal. Here is my polling question of you. Is this goal smart? Yes or no? So, Ann, while everybody's asking that, we have another question for you, or answering that question, that we have another question for you to answer. And this person's asking, at what level of the planning phase would you get subject matter experts involved? I would get the subject matter experts involved as soon as I had my game plan. And my game plan would be driven by using the planning checklist. So the first thing that I would probably want to do in planning, and, I, and I'm glad this question was asked because I wasn't going to cover it, but it's a good question. Uh, the first thing that I would do is I would talk to my boss. I would talk to whoever put this entity in the audit universe and updated it. And I would talk to that person to say, hey, what was in your mind uh, when you were thinking that we needed to audit this area and when you characterized it in the universe as a high, medium, or low risk uh, auditable unit? Because that would be the beginning of my game plan. And then we're going to talk about a planning checklist, and uh, I'll go over that in just a few minutes. Armed with that, I would begin to line up meetings with subject matter experts. And by the way, some of these subject matter experts exist within your audit department, at least within some audit departments. So I would start there so that we're not going out to the business like a clean sheet of paper, like a tabula rasa, like tell me what you do here, because that level of questioning is a little too basic. So I would start with the internal subject matter experts right after I spoke to my boss about what drove uh, the decision to audit this area. So it looks like people responded to the poll. And once again, bright group, uh, no is the, is the correct answer. Just the fact that there are numbers, and that's the whole reason I put that, this polling slide in the deck. Put it in the webinar because I think a lot of times, oh, we see a number, we think it's measurable. Uh, not, you know, not necessarily. We need to make sure it's also uh, realistic. Uh, you know, can, is it achievable? Uh, so the number is not the only, uh, the only component we're looking for. So I am going to move on now to the second question of the four questions, and that is how can we make sure that we complete, that we collect, excuse me, complete information when planning? And I don't know if you could see the little caption here. We back up our data on sticky notes because sticky notes never crash, you know. Uh, I don't know if that's so true. They fall off your computer. They do age. So, uh, but the main the main thought here is we need to focus on completeness, and this is where I'm advocating the use of a planning checklist because it creates some uh, some consistency. And remember, we want a structured, controlled, repeatable process uh, when we're planning so that we, we get the best and most information. I can't recall now for how long I've been using planning checklists. Uh, and I have to confess, I am a list maker in life. Uh, so, you know, when in doubt, I make a list. But I think the planning step in internal audits is too important to be, you know, just left up to individual discretion. And I think while it is an extra piece of documentation uh, that you need to use, or I'm suggesting that you use, I think the benefits far outweigh uh, having an extra piece of documentation. The overriding benefit of a planning checklist is that it minimizes audit risk. It minimizes audit risk by creating and fostering a consistent consideration of a range of topics. Now, I want to just pause at this point, and I want to emphasize consideration, because it's not enough to collect information. You have to think about, <coughs> excuse me, and know what you're looking at. So if you collect, just for example, financial information, what are you looking at it for? If you collect prior audit reports, 
what are you examining that prior audit report for? You're not just looking to see that the area was audited. You're looking at this data and all the data that you collect with one question in mind. What's relevant about this data that will affect or should affect the shape of the audit that I am working on? What is salient about the data that I'm looking at? What's meaningful about it? One of the benefits of a planning checklist is that it's a leveler. Uh, it makes it easy for new in charges as well as experienced in charges who have little uh, hands-on uh, experience with the area that they're auditing to do a consistent job. It also, and I, I, I think this is, is uh, maybe uh, an ancillary or added benefit, but it creates a repository for information that can be accessed by other auditors who will be working with you. Now, at this point, I want to pause and say, if you're in a very small audit department, it's possible that you're the only auditor working on it. And I think all the more if you're in a small department that we need consistency so that the quality of the audit doesn't change based on the experience and focus of the, of the individual. I cannot extol the benefits of a planning checklist uh, enough. I, I really can't. Uh, but we have other things to talk about. I thought it might be interesting. This is not a complete checklist. And if you, uh, if you are interested in formats for a planning checklist, you can email me and I'll be happy to uh, to send that out uh, send that out to you. This is just one one piece of a planning checklist, but and it wasn't intended. Uh, you're probably going to strain your eyeballs trying to read all the points on it. That was not the intent. The intent though was to lay out and give you a sense of how many different topics that there are that need to be covered. And I want to pause and say the relevance of all of these topics. Uh, to the audit is not necessarily there. You might research a topic and find out, okay, no, there's nothing popping in the regulatory environment that affects the shape of this audit, that affects the scope or objectives of this audit. But at least you've considered the data point. You haven't forgotten about it. And most importantly, you don't have to rely on your memory. One more polling question. The following are benefits of using a planning checklist. It minimizes audit risk. It fosters consistent consideration of an array of topics. It evens out differences in the auditor in charge work experience. All of the above, none of the above. And Anne, while everybody's answering that question, here's another one for you to answer. So how long, on average, should the audit planning process take? Oh, this is the this is the sixty four trillion dollar question. Because I think the more time you give people to plan, the more time they'll take. If you give people two weeks, they'll take two weeks. If you give them three weeks, they'll take three weeks. So here's where it gets really challenging. We've got to balance perfection, striving for perfection with practicality. We've got to get these audits done, and we've got to get these audits done, in my view, my opinion, within three months. Uh-oh, I just heard people thud to the floor when I said three months. I don't know if we have any government auditors. I'm not necessarily thinking about a performance audit. I was thinking about a straight operational risk-based review. But my bigger point is if it takes us eight months to get an audit out, Within most organizations, that is way too long. People have moved on, and the information is stale dated. What a lot of our clients do is they say, from a project management viewpoint, take two weeks. Now, if the area is de novo, I remember one client had gotten some acquisitions in a new country. There was no way two weeks was going to be enough, but they used a more iterative approach to that audit. But for most departments, they're, t they're trying to get the planning done, meaning set the shape of the audit, set the objectives, not necessarily the details on the risks and the details on the controls, but just set the audit objectives and the scope, uh, hit, the, hit these planning points within two weeks. 
And then after that, we can now begin, now that we know the boundaries of the audit, we can do a deeper dive in looking at uh, the uh, inherent risks and the controls. Brilliant, everybody that is on board this webinar is brilliant. All of the above is the correct answer. So I am now going to move on to the third question. And that question is, how can we gain a speedier sense of what's going on in the process? So now imagine we've spoken to the right people. We followed our, our planning checklist so we know that we've covered the topics with some completeness. And now how do we think about this stuff in a speedier way? And I need to pause and say speedier but without sacrificing uh, accuracy. And one of the competencies that I think we have to use at this point is process analysis. So if any of you listening joined audit and in a former life you were a business analyst, these are the skills that I am talking about. Uh, by definition, what we're talking about is looking for patterns and characteristics. We're looking for similarities and we're looking for dissimilarities. I don't know how many of you ever looked at a copy of Highlights magazine for those of you who have been in the classroom with me, you know it's like one of my favorite magazines. I think all kids should have to read it. You know, find the hidden fishy, which pictures look the same and different. Those kinds of exercises are the beginning of process analysis. It's, it's a way of categorizing information so that you can now begin to see, uh, to see patterns. So, for example... If you think about customer service and you think about the IT uh, help desk and you think about uh, complaint handling, you know, what do these things have in common? They're different. You could look at it and you could say, oh, customer service is very different than IT help desk and it's different than complaint handling. Or you could say, hey, wait a minute, they're, you know, they're all talking to people. There's always some problem that they're, that they're trying to resolve. They all use phones or whatever. You see the point. The benefits is being able to go for those trends and similarities, and this will then help you more rapidly identify the inherent risks, and it'll more rapidly help you identify the similar, you know, similar types of uh, of controls. It's all about really, it's all about the the pattern. Over the years, I've come up with five buckets. And you might have more. You know, I'd be interested to hear whether you have other core categories that you rely on when you are auditing. But I put processes into one of these five buckets. And as I'm collecting information, as I'm talking to people, I am trying to figure out what bucket should I put their process in. You know, I... I have the analogy, I've made the analogy that when we are planning audits, it's a little bit like putting a puzzle together, if you've ever put puzzles together, but you don't have the box cover. So you're putting these puzzle pieces together and you're, you know, you're, I don't know what this thing is supposed to really look like when I'm done. And by the way, if you've audited an area before, you might think you know what's happening, but let's face it, the area might have changed. You know, they, they might have, they might be doing things uh, a bit differently now. So let's, let's take a deeper dive on each of these. I just want to define what each of these uh, means. If we are looking at the maximizer, maximizer processes, the whole purpose behind them is to make as much as possible. Classic, classic is sales. However, if you're working for a nonprofit, you could say fund development. Do, I mean, can we, do we ever have enough money? Do we ever have enough sales? Do we ever have enough customers? Do we ever have enough members? You know, theoretically at any rate. Uh, so the idea of growing and growing, that's a maximizer. Make as much as possible, no limit. 
technically the limit might be our capacity to process that. But I'm talking fundamentally, if you were the head of sales, you would want as many sales as possible. In contrast, if you now consider minimize, minimize your processes, this, these are the processes where we don't want as much as possible. We want as little as possible or we want it just in time. So if you start thinking about inventory as classic for this. You can also think about staffing. You know, from a business viewpoint, we don't want to carry a lot of people on the payroll. Now, that doesn't make any sense. We just want to have as many people as we need to get the, to get the job done. If we look at another type of process, the line function. You know, um, and you'll notice terminology here, line processes or functions. And not to throw too much terminology at you, but we, dif- we say, if, let me state it this way. Think about those Russian nesting dolls, you know, the big one, then there's a smaller one inside it. And they're very congruent in how they look. Okay, the biggest difference is they're smaller. Analogously, that's the relationship between processes and functions. Processes would be equivalent to the largest doll, and the functions would comprise the process. So you'd have several functions making up a, uh, a process. Line functions are ones that directly impact goal achievement. So if you're thinking about what the process is supposed to do, why it exists, it's raison d'etre, the, these line uh, functions or processes are directly contributing to that goal achievement. As opposed to support processes or support functions. So the classic support, you, you look at human resources, finance, IT, These are departments that unless you are an organization that makes its money, generates revenue on IT solutions, these functions would support the the line functions. And that takes us to what probably from an audit perspective and now burgeoning with second line of defense functions are the control functions. So imagine now as you're, you're, you are collecting information and you're interviewing people, you're thinking about the business objective, the first level of analysis, in my view, is what bucket do we put this process in? You know, where, where do we slot this? And then that then helps us have a framework for collecting more information. So I want to pause at this point. I have another polling slide. Which set of processes are the most similar? Manufacturing, staffing, sales, quality control, reconciliations, quality control, user acceptance testing, sales, quality control, user acceptance testing. And Anne, while everybody's answering that question, here's an interesting question that came in the Q&A box. This person's asking, when you're interviewing the CEO, should you make that the first or the last interview out of the process? So when I'm interviewing the CEO, it's it's interesting. um, I'm separating my answer mentally because as an external, we're usually interviewing the most senior person first because they're usually engaging us. However, there are times when we need a second interview after we've interviewed other people to really make sure we understand what's going on. If I were internal and it was necessary for me to interview the CEO, I probably would not want to interview the CEO first. Uh, I'd want to talk to some people on my team first or talk to uh, whoever the risk owner was or the process owner, just so I would have a little flavor. Uh, the reality, though, I think is a little different. I think you'll interview the CEO when you can get on the CEO's schedule. So that might be earlier in the process than you would like or later in the process than, than, uh, than you would like. 
it's interesting. I have a question of my own. I'd be wondering why we'd need to interview the CEO for a lot of our audits, but that's just my question. Uh, if if we were planning an audit, I would want to interview the most senior process owner first to get that person's view from 25,000 feet above the ground. In my mind, that person is not necessarily the CEO, though. So it looks like we've got another brilliant response from the group. Reconciliations, quality control, and user acceptance all share the controls bucket. That's where I would have put all of them, and I think that's where you put all of them. And so at this point, I am going to move on to the fourth question in this, uh, in this webinar. And that fourth question is, how should we organize and analyze the data so that we can come to meaningful conclusions concerning an audit's objectives and scope? So I want to reiterate, I want to reiterate that what we are doing in planning, the way I'm defining the term planning, is setting the scope and objectives. We're setting the shape of the audit. We're considering the look-back period. You know, is it going to be six months? Is it going to be a year? You know, what is it based on the data that we have collected? Once we set the shape of the audit and have our boss's agreement or concurrence that, yeah, that's what we should be doing, then we're going to do more of a detailed assessment about the, about the risk and controls. So what we're talking about to answer this particular question is, where do we put all of that information that we collected from mostly the senior people that we've been talking to? By the way, I hope you see in the grand scheme of things, we're just a little, 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 little post-it note down in the lower left-hand corner. So the solution to where we put this information is, first of all, not putting every single piece of information that we've collected, uh, not feeling that we need to use every single piece of information. Uh, so I think we have to take a step back and say, okay, what did we learn? You know, who are the key people? What are the key activities? You know, what are the key uh, sources and uses, you know, of, of funds? What's been this area's history? Where did this area come from? You know, was it through acquisition? Was it organically grown? You know, really think about the, about the salient points. Digest that. So once we have figured out the answers to those questions, then I think we are ready to write a planning memo. And I don't know how many of you have planning memos built into your audit, uh, your audit methodology, particularly the smaller audit shops, but I really think that they are a terrific investment of time for so many reasons. So a couple of comments. The planning memo has a couple of purposes, but first and foremost, it is exclusively an internal document it's typically not shared, when I say internal, internal to internal audit. It is typically not shared with the people that we're auditing. Now, I mean, you're not going to go to hell in a handbasket if you share the planning memo with the people that you're auditing, but I'm not really sure why you would want to do that. I mean, you've been interviewing the people. You should have vetted your understanding when you were talking with them. The purpose behind the planning memo is to enable your boss or the head auditor to really vet your conclusions. And its intent is to prevent the audit from rolling down the road. We think we're wrapping it up, and somebody says, hey, did you audit this function? Oh, you can't end this audit unless you look at this. Did you test ABC. Oh, you can't complete this audit unless you tested ABC. So the idea here is to level set business knowledge, business acumen, and get buy-in from it, from really uh, execs on the on the audit side. Another purpose behind this document 
if you believe in writing everything in a report-worthy way, if you believe philosophically, as I do, that you should begin with the end in mind, meaning let's begin with the audit report in, in mind, uh, sections of this planning memo, I'll talk about that in a little bit, but sections of this can be repurposed, which is a nice way of saying uh, copied and reused in the audit report. The first thing, first benefit of a planning memo is that it lays out in black and white permanently the salient aspects or the important aspects of your research. So this planning memo, it's like cherry picking the key information that you gleaned while you were interviewing people. It focuses attention on aspects of the process under review that were either most important, most risky, uh, parts that changed the most, uh, you know, just the, the focal, really the focal areas. And it provides support for your decisions. It's proof that you thought about the right things and that you reached useful conclusions. And if you are auditing in an environment where you're the auditor in charge or the project lead and other auditors join you, well, now you have a way of bringing them up to speed because now they have a document that they can read. By the way, just because you have a planning memo, you still need to kick off the audit with the auditors that are joining you, but it has memorialized the data so people can go back and look at it. The the other thing that I think is, is important about it is that it's, it has consistent headings so that, once again, we are leveling the inexperience or the differences in experience across the department among the people who are planning reviews. So just to talk a little bit about generally what should this planning memo look like, most people that we work with put it in Word as opposed to putting it in Excel. Uh, a couple of comments. It should be written from the, you know, as though you, the auditor, were writing it. So it's possible that you might have gleaned some information from an intranet site concerning the processes objectives. That's very possible. Maybe you thought, hey, yeah, that's important. I want to copy that. Well, the only thing I would say to you is make sure that when you take a step back and look at what you've written, it's not a series of cut and paste from varied sources. It should not look, it should look like one person wrote it, not like, you know, person was all over the, uh, over, all over the lot with many different writing styles. Generally, the topics that are covered in a planning memo are things like the business context for the area. This is where you would talk about, well, what strategic business unit is it a part of? This is where you might talk about the fact that it was acquired through acquisition. Or you might cite facts like it's the largest business unit in your company. Another heading could be governance. Now, if you remember when we talked about the planning checklist, there were certain topics on the planning checklist where you consulted people to talk about those topics. Now the planning memo is basically these headings are kind of nudging you to say, okay, was there anything when you talked about governance with the people that you interviewed, was there anything about governance that affects the shape of this audit, its scope, its objectives? If so, write it under this heading. Was there anything about oversight that affects the shape of this audit? Write it under this heading. What are the key systems? By the way, this information about key systems, applications, and technology, regardless of whether you're doing an integrated audit, is important because we can't get work done without technology. That's crazy. I mean, it's just so much. Technology is so much a part of what we do that even if you don't consider yourself to be an IT auditor in the least, I think we still need to collect information uh, concerning application systems and technology. One is it about the competitive uh, in environment that's, that's important, that's noteworthy. The tail end of the document 
generally is the conclusion about the audit's scope and objectives. So imagine everything preceding the scope and objective in the, written out in the planning memo should be information that supports that decision. Now, alternatively, you might want the audit scope and objective written at the start of the document because it makes it easier for the reviewer, like your boss. But in that case, that's fine. Everything underneath the audit scope and objective should support that, uh, should support that decision. This is where you would also talk about any scope exclusions. This is where you would talk about whether you needed any special resources to complete the audit. Uh, by the way, I don't know how I forgot it, but one of the headings in this planning memo should be potential for fraud because it is an IIA standard that we definitely consider it, and it's just a nice placeholder. It's a nice reminder uh, to auditors to make sure that uh, potential fraud is one of the topics that we discuss. I am a huge proponent. It's to the point of a bias in terms of of uh, requiring planning memos because it, it takes so much of the risk out of doing the, uh, doing the review. So I've got another polling question for you. Which do you think is, is the better answer? Collect every bit of information you can because you can always exclude mentioning it in the planning memo or collect information strategically and in a disciplined way to avoid adding unnecessary hours to the audit. And Anne, there's a question that came in that relates to data collection that I think might be interesting to answer right now. It says, you know, what approaches have you used to overcome challenges when collecting data or information during the planning phase? So basically, how are you overcoming challenges in the data collection effort? What's your advice? The challenges in data collection, there are there are several actually. There's several, and I'm not sure which ones the the, the person who had the question was thinking about. I can think of of challenges that arise during the interview. I can think of challenges just in getting the interview scheduled. I can think of challenges where we've got the wrong people in the room. And we didn't realize that until we started the meeting, and now we can't really talk about what we wanted to talk about. Uh, you know, so a couple of a couple of things. Let's assume that the challenges to data collection are not the ones that we've already addressed, meaning key people uh, and and the topics we need to cover. I think that getting the right people in the room, that challenge is minimized if we are as transparent as possible in setting up our meetings. And when I say transparent as possible, I don't mean saying, hey, listen, I'd like to meet with you because we're going to audit your area. I mean, hey, we'd like to meet with you. We're going to be auditing your area, and we want to talk about these topics. And I wouldn't just say what you do, because that's written so so broadly so as not to be helpful, but you know, if you want to know about uh, peak periods, key volumes, uh, you want to talk about the workflow at a high level, I would write the email, because I'm imagining you're emailing the person to set up the meeting, or if you're on the phone, I would just tell them, this is the level of detail we want to get to. You know, it's, it's interesting, depending on the organization, depending on the size of the area, the senior person may or may not be very close to how the detailed work is performed. And by being explicit about the topics that you want to cover, I think that increases the chance that you'll get the right people in the, in the room. I am a strong proponent of convening what we call business briefings, where several people on the team that you will be auditing or you know, who, work, uh, who work on the team for the area that you will be auditing, meet with the audit, uh, the uh, in-charge auditor, uh, and talk about uh, what's going on. Uh, this meeting might be the kind of meeting that you convene as an opening 
or a traditional kickoff meeting. But the idea behind a business briefing is that you get to see the dynamics. You get to see, you know, politically how do people uh, interact. The other challenge I'm thinking about is during the interview, people might be reluctant to speak, and I think it's important to humanize yourself, engage in small talk at the end, be transparent about how much inf- uh, how you're going to use the information that you are going to uh, to collect. I think it's important strategically to disclose something about yourself so that they know that oh, you're not just an auditor, but you're actually a person as well. And once again, this group nails the question because the right answer is to collect the information strategically. Now, I will say, I think collecting information strategically is definitely easier said than done. But that's why we have the planning checklist. That's why we start the planning effort by talking to the person that put together the description of the auditable entity so that we're not going into this, you know, cold like a clean sheet, uh, you know, clean sheet of paper. So at this point, what I would like to do is just kind of summarize some of what I, what I think are the key points or the takeaway points uh, from the session and then we can you know, go to uh, go to some questions. I, I think that we need to keep the critical linkage in mind, meaning that connection between the objectives, the business objectives, the inherent risk, the controls. We need to keep that in mind at every stage of the audit, but most importantly in the planning stage. Uh, you know, it's very old school to jump right in and say, well, let's set our audit objectives and let's set our control objectives. Very old school because without having the business objective, understanding what they're supposed to do, what good looks like, it will be difficult to identify the inherent risk. And if you don't know what the inherent risk is, you will be on an Easter egg hunt trying to figure out what the the controls are. When we examine the business objectives, I think we, we did establish that you're going to have to tease them out of the conversation. They are not going to be hanging around like low-hanging fruit on the tree. But I think we want to make sure that they are specific enough uh, that they, they do have some measurable component, that they are achievable, that they're relevant to the overarching strategy and that they're they're time bound in some you know in some way. We talked about the planning checklist. If you don't have one, I think you really should get one. It'll it'll reduce uh, the data risk, uh, the data collection uh, risk. And then the process analysis piece. As you begin to collect the information, process analysis gives you a framework for organizing the information that you are uh, that you are collecting so that it begins to make some sense. You can begin to say, okay, I see the similarities from things that I have audited in the past to what they are doing, uh, you know, what they're doing today. And that will enable you to ramp up faster. And then I, I really feel major takeaway, if you don't have it today, uh, you know, develop a planning memo. If you're not sure, you know, of what should be in it, I gave you a couple of tips for the topics. Uh, and by the way, those topics might change based on the industry that you are in. Some will be more relevant than others. But the idea here, folks, is it's better to have a heading and then you as the auditor explain why it's not relevant than not to include it. You know, we want, we're really going for completeness and, and accuracy in the planning data collection. I know this expression is trite, but I really do believe it. Failing to plan is planning to fail. You know, people, you know, some people go through life and it's just, I, I, I think it's interesting that they respond, uh, you know, to, uh, to things that happen. But I think when it comes to auditing, I think we really need to go into this with a, um, you know, with a with a plan, with a framework that we can that we can follow. So at this point, Mark, are there any questions? There are a number of questions. We'll just we'll do one um, before we close out. And this person asked, "What basic questions should be asked in planning interviews?" 
Well, I think the questions that you're going to ask are going to vary based on who you are interviewing. And that's why I think it's important to have the planning checklist so we know what topics, you know, to follow. I think what I would what I would say is instead of trying to focus on the specific question, I, mean, I don't think we want to go through life like an ICQ, an internal control questionnaire with arms and legs. I think that what we want to do is go in with an interviewing approach. We, I think we want to go in, we call it funneling, where you start the interview by stating the framework. You know, hi, uh, thank you for meeting with me. As you know, we're here to... We're here because we're doing this audit, and we wanted to talk to you to gain a better understanding of fill in the blank, whatever that topic is, governance, oversight, the systems, technology, the regulatory environment. And I wanted to talk to you to get your thoughts on this topic. So I have a couple of questions for you. I'm interested in your answers. And let's just go from there. And then now you begin to funnel. First topic, open-ended question. You listen to their answer. You restate it to see if it makes sense to you to make sure that you captured it. And when they say, yes, you got it right, take your notes. You know, closed-ended question to confirm your understanding and then move on to the next topic. So I think it's more about the funneling approach than it is the question. I think that is a good time. So thank you, Anne, for presenting. You're very welcome, and I look forward to the next one.